Hello, this is Reverend Don Lewis coming to you from beautiful Salem. And tonight our question comes to us from Zaisan. And Zaisan has a question which he thinks has probably not been asked before. And I suspect within the context of the vlog this is true, although it's certainly not a particularly new question to me, uh, because it's part of a much larger question. And that larger question of modern history has been addressed on the vlog to some extent, but not Zaisan's particular question. And Zaisan's particular question is what do I think of George Pickingill? Uh, and whether or not Pickengill is an ancestor of modern Wicca. And my answer to this is that I suspect if anyone ever did any serious research into George Pickengill, which uh, I doubt is likely to happen, I think they'd probably find that he's pretty much what he's been represented to be. Uh, I do imagine that at least to some extent uh, he has influenced the development of modern Wicca, and I do pretty much believe that he did the things that are claimed that he did. Now, if we could go back um, to the 19th century and see the man and his practices, I don't know that we'd find them all that familiar. But I do think that they have influenced modern practice, and to some extent, modern practice, at least within certain traditions, uh, I'm sure does come down from it, as well as many other sources. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with George Pickengill, he's a 19th century figure uh, who was a practicing witch, and uh, is often cited as one of, one of the early uh, organizers of what is now Wicca, uh, which is the modern version of traditional religious witchcraft, at least according to the definition that I follow. Now, one of the aspects of this question, which we've kind of addressed before, but will continually, I'm sure, uh, have to address it, is the question of the history of modern witchcraft. And I am not one of those who holds with the idea that Gerald Gardner created modern witchcraft, although I certainly will grant that he created the Gardnerian tradition and those movements that come down from it. Uh, Gardner himself certainly did not claim to be creating, he claimed he was part of a larger and older movement. And I think that even modern research rather tends to uphold this. And you know, for many years, the high priestess who initiated Gardner, Dorothy Clutterbuck, uh, was the subject of all sorts of speculation, largely that she never existed at all. Uh, the late Doreen Valiente, in fact, demonstrated that yes, this lady did exist, uh, and therefore, she believed she was exactly what Gardner claimed. People then said, well, all right, the lady lived, she couldn't possibly have been a witch. Uh, most notably, Ronald Hutton, in his book Triumph of the Moon, wrote extensively on why she could not possibly have been a witch and must have been a conservative Christian. And his argument turned largely on her diaries, uh, which he said pretty much proved that she was not pagan. The interesting thing is Philip Heselton subsequently did quite a bit of investigation on Dorothy Clutterbuck and published parts of her diaries. And if you have read them, I think you'd have to agree with me that not only do they not show her as a conservative Christian, but they're pretty much as much a smoking gun as you could expect for a pagan woman who admittedly was closeted all her life. Because the only thing that people definitely do agree is that if she was pagan, she was very closeted. Yet here are her diaries, which were intended for public consumption. They're called diaries, but that they were shared with other people. And what is in them? Well, there are a number of poems dedicated to pagan deities and a number of poems dedicated to the fairy queen. And while we could argue whether the Fairy Queen was a historical cipher for the goddess, in the 1930s, when this lady was writing these diaries, a great many people in the folklore community certainly would have understood it that way. And I personally don't see how much more of a smoking gun you could need. Nonetheless, those people who don't wish to accept it do not accept it and probably never will. Uh, then there's Alexander's grandmother, uh, another one who was been insisted could not possibly be any of the things he claims. Recently, Jamal de Fiasi has done quite a bit of research on this lady and found that she pretty much followed out what she was said to be, and that she was very much practicing a sort of witchcraft, which, by the way, Maxine Sanders has maintained all these years. So when we look at these early figures and people actually do research, they very often turn out to be pretty much what they were said, so I'm sure that Pickengill most likely would too. And the early American Wiccan figures, such as Lydia Beckett or Caroline High Corral, and various others, if anyone actually did any research into them, which uh, many people seem pointedly disinclined to do, 
they would find that they are pretty much what they've always been said to be as well. Now, this still leaves the argument of whether what they were practicing should properly come under the heading of Wicca or witchcraft or something else. But that they were practicing something is pretty clear from the things that one finds. Um, so, basically, I guess my answer is yes, I absolutely do think uh, that Pickengill has certainly influenced to some extent the development of modern Wic Wicca and certainly represents an aspect of traditional witchcraft. So those are my thoughts on that, and until next time, may you blessed be. Hi, I'm Terry the Stone Lady. For all your crystal and stone needs, come to witchschoolstore.com. Come visit us at witchschoolstore.com and namaste. Come visit us at witchschoolstore.com.